theyeshiva.net. Parshas Vayishlach, Perik Lamed Dalet, Pasuk Aleph, Chapter 34 of Genesis, Verse 1. If you don't have a Chumash, please look with somebody else. Vatetzei Dina Bas Leia, Asher Yelda Leyakov, Leroy's Bivnois Haaretz. Dina, the daughter of Leia, whom she birthed with her husband Yaakov, went out, Leroy's to see Bivnois Haaretz in the daughters of the land. Vayaroy's a Shem ben Chamor Hachivin Isi Haaretz. Shem, the son of Chamor, from the tribe of Chivi, who was the prince of that region, saw her. He observed her. Vayikachaisa, he took her. Vayishkavaisa, he lay with her. Vayaneha, and he afflicted her, he violated her. Vatidbak nafshoi bedina bas Yaakov. His soul cleaved. His soul felt dveikos, connection, to Dina, the daughter of Yaakov. Vayev asanara. He loved the young girl, Vayidaber Alevanara, and he spoke to her heart. He spoke on her heart, meaning he got to her heart. And as the, ter- the Torah continues the story, he became adamant, yearning, pining, craving to have Dina given to him as a wife. The family came to negotiate with Yaakov. And the brothers of Dina, his father, Chamor, came to negotiate, all the while while Dina is in the mansion of Shechem. She is there, she was abducted, and she remained there. She was not freed. But during that time, they came to negotiate, so to speak, to try to do the deal in a more ethical fashion, even though she was abducted. But now he already wanted to finalize it and get Yaakov's agreement. The continuation of the story is well known. Yaakov remains silent. Dina is, has been kidnapped. The brothers, Shimon and Levi, make a deal with him and they tell him, why don't you convince your entire city to circumcise yourself so that we could continue to do business with you, we'll handle with you. Chamar made an offer. Why don't you be with us, become part of our, our, our region, our society. You will marry our children, we will marry your children. Our merchandise will be open to you. Our world of commerce will be open to you. They agree with the condition that the men have to circumcise themselves. And on the third day, they come and declare war on Shechem. They kill the adult males and they free Dina from Shechem's palace. Yaakov is upset with Shimon and Levi about what they did as the story continues. But what we want to focus here is on the opening story. Why did Dina go out? The Torah, as usual, is very ambiguous. What was the objective? She wanted to see the girls. Literally means Dina went out to see the girls of the land. She wanted to see them. She wanted to see their style. Wanted to socialize with them. Wanted to see their fashion. Wanted to learn about their culture. Wanted to just hang out with people. Maybe it was a family filled with boys. She wanted some female company. <laughs> if you wish. The Torah doesn't say, why did she go out? Dina, three words. And after that, catastrophe strikes. And her life is changed. So let's see Rashi. Dina Basleya. On the bottom you see Rashi. By the way, there are many more Chamashim, right? I see you just brought. On the back table where I'm pointing... There are many more books, looks like five or ten more. So you could take one and open it to page 99. It'll be a more delightful class for you if you could see inside. Yeah, you see in the back, thank you. If not, you could look with somebody near you who has one. But it's worthwhile to look inside. God willing, the Shia will be posted on the yeshiva.net. And there's always shorts, if, when applicable, there are source sheets on the bottom. And the source sheets will include it as well. But for now, if you could look inside. Zakt Rashi. Take a look. Bas Leia. Dina is the daughter of Leia. Veloi Bas Yaakov. And not the daughter of Yaakov. The Torah identifies her as Bas Leia Asher Yoldol Yaakov. Almost like Yaakov is a half a stranger here. She is the daughter of Leia and not the daughter of Yaakov. She's the daughter of Leia. She's also the daughter of Yaakov. He was her father. 
He fathered her just like Leah mothered her. The Torah doesn't say, Dina bas Leah v'yakov. Bas Leah, asher yolda liyakov. She is the daughter of Leah. Leah gave birth to this girl with Yaakov. It's like almost Yaakov is, is, is set aside. He's almost like he happens to be part of the story because he happened to be Leah's husband. But, you know, since when does that matter? Zakrashi v'loi bas Yaakov? Elo. Al shem yitzi osa nikras bas Leah. She's identified as a daughter of Leah not because she was the daughter of Leah any more than the daughter of Yaakov. But because this quality is one that she received from her mother. Al Shem Her going out, that's what causes the Torah to identify her as a daughter of Leah. Sha'af hi Yatsanishoisa. Because Leah was also the outgoing woman, the woman who was Yatsanis. Yoitse means to go out. Vayetse, he went out. Sha'af hi Yatsanishoisa. She was always so that woman who goes out. She is the outgoing type. She doesn't remain indoors. She goes outdoors. Shenemar, how do I know? How can you make such a statement about Leah? So Rashi says there's a clear verse in Parshas Vayetse. Vatetse Leah likrosai. Genesis 30, 16, Perik Lamet, Posik Tazayin, Leah went out of her tent to greet her husband Yaakov. She went out, Vatet say Leah, Leah is also the woman who is outgoing, who goes out. Va'aleha mashlu ha-mashl. And it's on Dina, on whom the parable was said, Ki'ima kibita, Like mother, like daughter. This is a verse in Yecheskel, an expression like mother, like daughter, like her mother is her daughter. Who was the set on? Rashi says this was a parable spoken about Leah and Dina. Like mother, like daughter, like daughter, like mother. In other words, this characteristic, this quality of going out, Dina inherited. This was a genetic, generic, or similar inheritance, whatever you want to call it, nature or nurture, but it was an inheritance, something that she bequeathed, something that she learned something that she was taught by osmosis or actively, consciously or unconsciously from Leah, who, was also had, who also possessed this characteristic. She looked to go out, vatetze Leah, and thus vatetze Dina, in the next portion, Dina also goes out. That's the end of Rashi. What was bothering Rashi? Why does he have to say this? Rashi says clearly he's bothered by the fact that the Torah identifies her as Bas Leah, not Bas Leah and Yaakov. So how does he justify it? Of course she was Yaakov's daughter. But this story, in this story, she's Leah's daughter. It's like sometimes you'll tell a girl, you'll say, ah, this is Mamish, your mother speaking. Or you look just like your mother. Or this is something your mother would do. Of course we know she has a father too. But this quality, or this appearance, or this gesture, or this habit... Or this nature is a reflection that she is her mother's daughter. Or sometimes her father's daughter. Or his father's son or his mother's son. You're the spitting image of your mother. Whether in your facial features or in your physique or in your behavior. Something your mother would do. This is something that Leah would do. Here we could see she is the daughter of Leah. Like mother, like daughter. Even though of course Yaakov was her father as the Torah says. Asher yalda Yaakov. This is apparently what Rashi is saying. You remember this Rashi when you were in school? You remember this Rashi? I'm sure some of you remember this Rashi, right? Now, what's your in- instinctive feeling? Instinctive feeling. You can answer. Feel free to answer. Is, it sounds positive or negative? Negative. Everybody unanimously almost said negative, right? Wh- why do you get that feeling? I'm just wondering. Because of the result. Okay, that's that's. You're saying it's like blaming her victim. She went out. Stay indoors, and you'll be safe. And blaming her mother. <laughs> uh, okay. Interesting observation. So the feeling, I think, that most people get from this Rashi, and I think this is how it's been taught throughout all the generations, even though Rashi doesn't say it explicitly, is that there is a negative connotation here. 
And the negative connotation is, why are you going out? You went out and you made yourself vulnerable. Of course, he doesn't mean to absolve the perpetrator. We should understand it in perspective. He doesn't mean to say that Shechem is a saint and Dino was the problem. But what he's saying is that sometimes we open ourselves up to vulnerability to perpetrators, to no good nicks who may hunt down those people who are vulnerable. And Rashi says, and it wasn't Dina herself. You should know that this quality she received from her mother, Afhi, as he puts it so explicitly, Afhi Yatsonis Oysa. She had that same quality. She needed to go out. She felt compelled to go out. That's what it seems Rashi is saying. It explains Basleya. It gives us a little bit of a negative connotation. And it's almost like a critique for Leia's going out. I think this is the common conventional perspective that boys and girls learning Chumash and Rashi for generations and generations just pick up from this Rashi. At least that's how I was taught this Rashi when I was a child in Chumash and we learned Chumash and Rashi. And every year when I see it, that same interpretation comes back. Yes? Okay, yeah, right, but that, I'm saying what Rashi says. I'm discussing Rashi's interpretation. The problem with all of this is a striking... And that is, okay, we're learning Rashi here. The Medrash, for example, Medrash Rabbi Parshas Vayishlach, speaks negatively, clearly, explicit terms it sees a negative connotation of a But when we look at Rashi, as Rashi says very often, he has carved his own path in explaining Chumash. I've come to explain what the Pasuk says. He'll often quote parts of a Medrash. He'll leave out parts. He'll bring in parts. He'll take an excerpt. He'll change some details. Because he's not a book that quotes other sources. He carved out a path to understand Chumash, and he's very clear about what he says. When you read this Rashi with the above interpretation, there's something strikingly obscure and enigmatic. Ladina goes out. Why does she go out? That's why we call her the daughter of Leah, because her mother was the same way. And I'll show you with Vatetse Leah Likrasai. So let's now go see his source of Leah going out, and what Rashi said about that time when Leah went out, which is our only reference point to understand Rashi. So I'm going to ask you to turn your Chumash a few pages earlier, Perik Lamed, Posuk Tes Zion, where Leah indeed goes out to greet Yaakov. This is going to be page, the story of the Dodoyim, page 86. Page 86 in your Blue Chumashim, the top verse, Perik Lamed Pasuk Yudala, Genesis thirty fourteen. Vayelech Reuven b'meik tzir chitim vayimtzu dudoyim basada. Reuven goes out during the days of the wheat harvest and he finds dudoyim, mandrakes or jasmine in the field. Vayav yoysam aleyayimo. He brings the jasmine or the mandrakes to his mother Leia, and Rachel tells Leia, "Tni no li mi dudoyim bneich." Please share with me some of the jasmine of your son. And we all know Leah's famous response, not only did you take my husband from me, you're also going to take the mandrakes. And Rachel says, okay, tonight let, your, let our husband Yaakov come to you in lieu of the mandrakes. Now take a look, Pasuk Tez Zion. Here is the critical verse. Vayavo Yaakov min hasode ba'erev. Yaakov returned, he came from the field. He was in the field during the day, and he came back in the evening. Vateitze Leah likrosoi. Leah didn't remain in the tent, preparing the yoich, preparing the soup. She went out. Vatetse Leah. She went out, likrosai, towards him to greet him. Vatoimer, and she says, A light tovoi, come to me. Okay, good point. You feel very surprised by the story because Leah seems passive, and here she's 
portrayed as being pretty active or more aggressive. Mandrakes, it's a type of flower. Rashi translates it as jasmine, another type of plant. Huh? Yes, some say, many commentators said they were conducive for fertility. That's one of the interpretations. The doyim from the word doid, anila doidi vidoidi li, which means love. They were conducive for love, for fertility, for intimacy. They were used at the time. Others say it was barley, barley stalks, different interpretations. But this is not our focus today, this story. Our focus is vatetze leia. Leia goes out and says, I have earned you with the doyim of my son. And the Torah continues and says, Vayishkav ima balailahu. And Yaakov was with Leah that night. It's interesting, it doesn't say Balaila Hahu, it says Balaila Hu, which grammatically seems problematic. The next verse, Vayishma Elohim Eleya, Vatar Vatelud Leyakov Ben Chamishi. Hashem listened to Leah. What did he listen to? She never said anything. He listened to Leah. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a fifth son. Hashem has given me my reward. And his name was Yisachar, which means Yesh Schar. There is Schar. Let's take a look how Rashi sees the story. Leah goes out to greet Yaakov Avinu, to welcome him. She tells Yaakov, tonight you're coming to my tent. I have earned it. As a result of that, a new child is born, Yisachar. And it says, Hashem, listen to Leah. Says Rashi, Pasuk Yudzayin. Vayishma Eloikim Eleah. Shehoysa misave umachzeres lahar b'shvatim. What does it mean he listened to Leah? Where did she speak? He listened to Leah. He listened to Leah's passion. Leah was craving. Leah was yearning. She was pursuing the goal of having more and more shvatim. Building up the first family of the Jewish people. Where do you see this? Where do you see this? Vatetse Leah Likrosoi. Leah eagerly ran out of the tent to welcome Yaakov. Hashem heard this. He saw Leah's passion to greet Yaakov, to welcome Yaakov. She wanted to build the first Jewish family, and he chose to follow and give her, allow her to fulfill her dream and add yet a fifth son, Yisachar. And then she would have a sixth son right after, after that, not right after, after that, who would be named Zvulun, and that would constitute Leah's shear in the building of the first family of the Jewish people, the, f- the first half, the first six tribes belong to Leah. This is the source that Rashi uses to describe... Is this driving you Meshuggah like it's driving me Meshuggah? Okay. <laughs> You're asking a good question. She had to go out. If not, he would have gone to Rachel. (laughs) Very good. She would have gone to Rachel, and then Rachel would have sent him back, so she just went out, right? In other words, you're saying it doesn't prove anything. Even if Leah was the most introverted insider, even if Leah didn't leave her house for anything, she would still have to go out simply to say, come. So Rashi is concocting from this, a whole story about Leah's makeup or chemistry or disposition or character or nature when essentially she had to do it. And yet we see that the fact that the Torah says she did it, even though it's not so relevant to the story, it could have said that Yaakov came to her tent. How he figured it out, you'll figure it out like any other detail. So many details are filled with gaps, you just have to put in the gaps. It doesn't say every detail. Probably she told him the story too. It doesn't say that she told him the story. So you would just say, Yaakov came to her and she had another child. The fact that the Torah points it out that she went out, Rashi, based on the Medrash, seems to indicate the Torah is trying to tell us something about Leah. What? As Rashi puts it clearly, she was craving to build the family. Even though she already had four children, she wanted more and she wanted more. 
more and more, and she got the more and the more with Yisachar and Zavulim. Where do we see this passion? We see this passion by her enthusiastically going out to greet Yaakov. Now when we learn this Rashi, do we feel here a negative connotation or a positive connotation? Very positive. God listens to Leah. What is he listening to? He's listening to something negative in Leah? No. As you could see from Rashi, the feel everybody gets justifiably is it's Leah's virtue being depicted. It's Leah's righteousness being depicted. It's Leah's passion and enthusiasm to fulfill her role in the world and to bring so many lights into the world that is being depicted. So if say Leah is it a positive thing or a negative thing? Do you feel that Rashi is judging her in a negative way and saying, nah, she should have stayed inside. Just be passive. If Yaakov is interested, maybe we'll think about it. She doesn't do that. She goes out. She's aggressive about it. She shares her voice. She tells Yaakov, come. In other words, she displays her passion, as Rashi says. In the words of Rashi. We don't see the Vatetse Leia being judged, even subtly, in a negative way. On the contrary, and God embraces it, he responds to it. He gives her that schar, she has a child, and she names him Yisachar, yes, schar, for the shivcha, but perhaps also for the dudayim. When we come now, the next parasha to Vayishlach, Rashi says, Vatetse Dina Bas Leah. Dina was the daughter of Leah. And what does it mean she was the daughter of Leah? Sha'af hi yatsonis hoiso. That she was also somebody who went out. Shanemar vatetse leah likrosoi. And then he even adds, like mother, like daughter. In other words, this is just like mommy. But mommy was just praised. Mommy was just depicted in a very positive way, in a very beautiful way. God responded. So what is Rashi doing with us here? You're telling me that Dina got this quality from Leah. Leah did it, it was a very positive thing. Suddenly now it became negative when she got this from her daughter. This ambiguity in Rashi is very striking. Everybody interprets this Rashi as a negative judgment for Dina. But his actual text, the text of Rashi, is actually saying something very positive about Dina. She did what Leah did. Leah is praised for what she did. Leah's, Leah's act is seen in an extremely positive light. And that's the only thing Rashi says. Rashi doesn't say, yes, it could have been like her mother, but then she did it differently than her mother. No, like mother, like daughter, without anything else. Which means that without any preconceived notions, with full objectivity, Rashi is not criticizing Dina. I shouldn't say it that way. Rashi doesn't see the verse, the text, as criticizing Dina. Actually, the opposite. He sees the text saying something positive about Dina. Tracing it back to her mother, to her mother's vatetse leia, the vatetse dina and the vatetse leia are actually reflective of each other. They mirror each other, even though the end of the story is not positive, obviously. But there's no blame cast on dina here. Which indeed would also make sense because of another issue. There's a famous principle in Gemara and Baba Basra and other places. Afilu bignus behemet meyel edibir hakosov. The Torah tries to protect the dignity even of an impure animal. In Noyach, it doesn't say take an impure Tomedic animal into the ark. It says all the kosher animals came in and all the animals that were not pure. To protect even the dignity of an impure animal. Whenever the Torah says something negative about somebody, or we can interpret it, it's for a very specific reason in order to teach us an important lesson that we couldn't have not known without it. And therefore, whenever we have a choice to interpret something positively or negatively, the principle is always not to right away go to the negative and say, there's a disgraceful comment here, but to say there's a positive comment here. The Pasuk doesn't say anything negative about Dina. What would urge Rashi to say, we're going to reveal something negative about her? It says, Vatet Dina. Why would Rashi be compelled to say, there is a judgment here about Dina that she did something negative. So some say, well, Rashi wants to say it wasn't her fault. She got it from mommy. But that only transfers the question. <laughs> You're trying to absolve and show the innocence of Dina by casting her mother in a negative light, by casting Leah in a negative light. And as we already established, when it comes to Leah, he completely sees the story in a positive light. 
So that means that there is something here to Rashi that perhaps we're not getting, perhaps we're not feeling, perhaps we're not experiencing. Well, others say, of course it has, Rashi has to say this. Even though we don't try to speak negatively, but he has no choice. The Torah says, Vatetse Dina Bas Leah. The Torah identifies her as the daughter of Leah. Why? Why not the daughter of Yaakov? We have to say that the text was trying to compare her to Leah. So what other option is there but to say that this quality she got from Leah going out, she going out, and it's negative because we're forced from the text to do that. But the truth is, when you look through the Mepharshim, many commentators, the Arizal, the Shach, there's a whole shtickle from Kedushas Levi about this, give it a very different interpretation, very nice interpretation. They say, you know why she's called the daughter of Leah? Because Leah was completely responsible for this girl. Why was Leah completely responsible for this girl? Rashi himself said this in Parshas Vayetze. In Parshas Vayetze, and I'm going to quote the Rashi, if you want to see it, you can see it inside, it's going to be page 86 again. Page 86, Perik Lamed, Pasuk Chafalov. V'achar Yolda Bas, Leah had a daughter. V'tikre Shma Dina, and she gave her a name, Dina. Zakt Rashi, why Dina? The only name that the reason is not discussed in Torah. We know the name for every one of the children besides Dina. Why not? Suddenly there was no name, there was no rhyme or reason. Zakt Rashi, Pirshu Rabbi Seinu, Shadana Leah Din Ba'atzma. Leah judged herself. Dina from the word Din. She judged herself. She was supposed to have a male. She knew if she has a male, Yaakov is only going to have 12 sons. That means she would have seven sons. The two maids of Yaakov, Bila and Zilpa, had two each. There will be seven for Leah, another two for Bila, eight, nine, another two for Zilpa, ten, eleven. And Rachel, even if she has a child, would be blessed only with one child means Rachel will not even have the shear of the maids of Yaakov, Bila, and Zilpah. So Leah judged herself, and she prayed, and the fetus was changed to a female. That female became Dina. And Rachel indeed had two sons, Yosef and Binyamin. So Dina was not a product of Yaakov and Leah. The product of Yaakov and Leah would have been a boy. Dina was the daughter of Leah. Rashi himself gave this interpretation in Parshas Vayetze. This is a beautiful reason to say Bas Leah, why she's the daughter of Leah. Of course she was the daughter of Yaakov, but her entire entity and existence was a tribute to Leah's prayers and Leah's sensitivity to Rachel. If that's the case, why do you have to justify the Bas Leah? By saying something negative. When you could justify the Basleya by saying a beautiful interpretation that other commentators say, and it works with Rashi because that is the only interpretation he brings for the reason of Dina. And it's an interesting thing here, Stam Derech Agav. Why doesn't that reason say clearly in Chumash? The reason for every one of the Shvatim is explicit in Chumash. Ruuvain, because Leah said, God saw my pain. Shimon, Hashem saw my agony. Levi, my husband, will accompany me. Yehuda, now I will be grateful. Yisachar, Yeshchar, Zvulun from the word home, residence. My husband will live with me. Naphtali, I became connected with my, with my sister. Asher from the word fortune, Ashri. Every name of her child, of her children, the Torah accounts for why she gave that name. One exception, her daughter. And Rashi just said a beautiful reason. And of course the answer is, and here we see how precise it is, the answer is because this reason was not explicit. This reason remained concealed in her heart. Because it remained concealed in her heart, it also remained concealed from the text. All the other reasons were explicit. They were revealed. She celebrated. Yehuda means gratefulness. Now I'm grateful. Yisachar zvulun. Yilevi, finally my husband is going to be connected to me. She was proud of these reasons. But this was all about the sensitivity to Rachel. She didn't walk around and say, by the way, she wasn't supposed to be a girl. You know what that would do psychologically. <clears throat> she didn't walk around saying this whole reason and what happened and all this and what I said. Do we even know what, how much she knew about it? We're not even sure how much she knew about this. But perhaps she knew this was a reason that had to remain confidential. But this is a beautiful reason why Dina is called the daughter of Leah, even more than the daughter of Yaakov. So if Rashi was looking for a good reason, he didn't have to choose a negative connotation, which all brings us back to the same point. Perhaps, just perhaps, we're misunderstanding Rashi. Rashi never meant to say anything negative about Dina. Certainly, 
because he's not saying anything negative about Leah. He's actually saying maybe something very positive about both of them. And that's why he doesn't see this as choosing a negative interpretation when you can choose a positive interpretation. He sees this as choosing a wonderfully positive interpretation. And indeed, it's clear from the fact that he references her and he says she was a copy, a replica of her mother. Ki'ima kibita, like mother, like daughter. But the question then would be, how we understand this, how we to understand this positively when it comes to Dina? By Leah, I know. She was searching to build her family. What about Dina? Where's the positive connotation? The negative, I understand. We know the negative interpretation. Stay home. Why go out to these places where there's dangerous people? There are creeps. You are vulnerable. There are people who may violate you. Stay home in a cocoon of holiness, sacredness, and purity. Bleib in the heim of the mama and the baba. Well, there was no baba here. But stay home with your mother and with your aunt. All of your aunts, your three aunts, takes a village to raise a child, stay home in the safe place, that's where to be. You go out, I understand the negative interpretation, but we're establishing it that perhaps Rashi means something else completely. And then he assumes that we immediately pick up why this is so positive. What is that? Yes. That's what I want to discuss now. In order to see how clear this is, we're going to look at one more Rashi today. One more Rashi today, which will bring it all together. This very same Parsha, just before this story. This is chapter 34 of Bereshis, and this is chapter 33, Lamed Gimel. If you go one page earlier, we're going to go to page 97. I'm sorry, page 96. Page 96. Perik Lamed Beis, Pasuk Chav Gimel. In the previous chapter, we learned about Yaakov's meeting with Esav. He met Esav. He thought Esav wants to kill him. Esav wants to destroy him. He's been told that Esav is marching towards him with 400 troops. Yaakov is terrified, we learned in the beginning of Ayishlach. He splits his camp into two groups to increase the chances for survival. He sends a lavish bribe to Esau in order to bribe him. And he also prays to Hashem, to the Rebbeinu Shalom, for salvation for himself and his family. Chapter 33, the actual encounter happens. Esau turns out to be very different. He runs towards Yaakov. He embraces him. He falls on his neck. He kisses him. And they weep. He is moved to tears. He is emotionally stirred. There's no remnant here of hatred or the yearning for violence or bloodshed. On the contrary, he doesn't want to take Yaakov's gift. He says, please keep it. He offers to remain with Yaakov, to go together with him. A different brother emerges. But when Yaakov prepares for this encounter, he is is terrified. As the Torah says, he is afraid. Take a look, page 96, Perik Lamed Beis, Pasuk Chav Gimel, chapter 32 of Genesis, verse 33. Balailahu. Yaakov gets up that night. Again, here it says Balailahu, not Balaila, Hahu, just like by the birth of the conception of Yisachar. Vayikach es Noshav. Takes his two wives, Shtei Shivchais of two mates, Ves Achad Asr Yiladov, and his 11 children. Doesn't say Bonov, his 11 sons, Yiladov. Children, his 11, Yelad comes from the word Leda, Ledes, birth, the 11 offspring, children who were born from Yaakov. And here we are astounded. What happened to one of his children? Well, Binyamin wasn't born yet, so he only had 11 sons. But in Parshas Vayetze, we learned that he had a daughter, Dina. She must have been here. Did she disappear? Is she not part of the story anymore? Obviously, she didn't disappear because in the next chapter, she will suddenly become the center figure of the story. She will be violated by Shechem, and the whole Shechem will be destroyed for her dignity and her salvation. So Dina was here. Where is Dina? We mention everybody. Two wives, two maids, Rachel, Leah, Bila, Zilpa, 11 sons. But there's a daughter. What happened to her? This is a difficult question. When you read the text, you want to know why is his daughter deleted from the text? Did she disappear? Did she come later? What happened? So Rashi tells us something very powerful. The last line in the first column of Rashi, Ves achat 
Vidina Hechan Hoysa. Where was Dina? Zakt Rashi, Rashi says, Nosna Beteva. He placed her in some box. Vinal Befaneha. And he lacked it. Shaloyitin Ba Ace of Enoch. He confined her in a box, whatever that box looked like, I don't know. He did not want Ace of his brother to cast his eyes on Dina. Naturally, he was afraid. He knew what Dina looked like. She was extraordinarily beautiful. We see how Shechem took to this girl. In fact, as the Medrash Rabbah points out, a fascinating observation. It's not our topic today, but it's a fascinating observation that the most powerful, potent expressions of affection and love in the whole Chumash are in the parsha of Dina and Shechem. Ahava, Chafetza, Tshuka, Dveikus, extraordinary terms. Dina had something special about her, internally and externally. Yaakov was petrified. The last one who he wants to have contact with Dina is his brother Esau. He doesn't care if Esav sees everybody else. Rachel, of course, was also beautiful. Rachel was married to Yaakov. Dina was a girl. And Yaakov Yaakov did not want contact between Dina and Esav, even just with eyesight. That's why she's not in the text here. In other words, of course she was here. But the text is always about the revealed, what is open. She's not open. She's not to be seen. Just like physically she's not to be seen, in the text she's not to be seen. As I told you before, when she was born, the reason for her name is also not in the text, because it was not to be seen. If it's not to be seen, it's also not seen in the text. It's invisible. It's hinted. And then Rashi adds something astounding, and it would seem very disturbing. For this there was a consequence, a negative consequence. There was a penalty. Shemona me'ech achiv. He created an obstruction between Dina and his brother. He prevented Dina from encountering his brother. You would think Yaakov should be extolled for this. He was being a good father. Why? Why? Shema tachzirenu lemutav. Perhaps she would be the one to transform Esau. She would be the one to reorient his soul. He would become the good person that he's capable of becoming. Indeed, she fell into the hands of Shechem. Now, when we read this Rashi, we must wonder, there was a penalty for this? There was a negative consequence for this? Yaakov had a daughter, Dina. Yaakov knew Esav. It's his brother. Esav wasn't the saint of the generation, to put it mildly. He did not want Esau to cast his eyes on Dina. Any person sitting in this room would say, Yaakov is a good daddy. He's a fine atata. You even agree. Excellent. Rashi was the one who described things that Esau did. And suddenly here we see it's a whole different story. Yaakov is brought, is a count, Yaakov is being criticized, rebuked, chastised. Why? Shemona me'achiv. Mona me'achiv literally means in Yiddish, etir abgehalten von sein Bruder. He obstructed her path to his brother. Or he obstructed his brother's path to her. He created a mechitza barrier. He didn't allow them to have contact. Perhaps to develop a connection. Maybe even to get married, to have a relationship. V'nofla What do we see from this story? What do we learn from this story? We learn here something about Dina. We learn something about Esav. We learn something about Yaakov. But the two greatest points we learn is first and foremost about Dina. Dina was blessed with a unique characteristic, with a unique quality. And what was this quality? It was the quality to be able to transform Remember, Dina herself was a transformed person. Dina didn't look as transformation as some shocking, weird, bizarre reality. The philosophy, as people like to say, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. Anybody ever told that to you? (laughs) This is who I am. Now, on one hand, it seems like very psychologically sound. 
But there's also a trap there. It's also a trap of victimhood, a trap of paralysis, a trap of moral or emotional stagnation. I am who I am and I'm destined to be the same person. And if that means I'm miserable, or I'm narcissistic, or I'm traumatized, or I'm full of vengeance or hate or insecurity or fear, or all the other adjectives you can apply to yourself, present company excluded, of course. I am destined to remain in that place. Well, Dina's very genetics were the stuff of transformation. For her transformation wasn't a privilege, a virtue, a calling, a nice shalashuddha speech, a nice sheer, a good vart. For her transformation was her raison d'etre. It was the very meaning, the very stuff of her identity. But that's just the background. But what does this Rashi teach us? Dina was gifted with the power of influence. How could you punish Yaakov for protecting his daughter? Because maybe, 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 maybe Dina will do good things for Esau. Apparently this wasn't a maybe. Apparently Yaakov, who knew his daughter, should have had the confidence that in the connection between Dina and Esau, there will be one person who comes out triumphant and the other person who will be transformed. And it's going to be Esau who will be transformed by the influence of Dina. Apparently, Dina had that personality, that strength of character, that inner light, that she literally could transform souls. She could bring out, as Rashi says, Tachzirenu Lemutav. She could take somebody who looks at himself or herself in a negative way. They see themselves as evil, as immoral, as promiscuous, as completely without meaning. And Dina could bring out from them their infinite light. The fact that you are a creation of the divine, the fact that you are an ambassador of love, of light, of hope, that you should be able to see yourself in a new way. Of course, Rashi uses the word Shema, maybe. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's going to be ace of choice. Nobody can guarantee anything about anybody. I could try to influence somebody and have all the power. Ultimately, you're going to have to make a choice. Yaakov can't say for sure he knows what Esav is going to do. But I ask you a question. Even when you're dealing with somebody on the level of Yaakov, how can I say that you're being punished? Let's go use the word. You're being held accountable for something that you were doing right. You were trying to protect your daughter. So I ask you now a question. Would you allow your child to become vulnerable to a very, very dangerous situation? Because maybe in the process, she may be able to save herself and the other person. It's a pretty irresponsible thing to do. You don't subject a child to a place of physical noxious fumes or horrible contagious diseases because maybe their immune system will actually become even stronger. You have to, I'm not getting into that debate. Don't, don't, uh, I'm not discussing that. I'm not talking about the issues of vaccination. I'm talking about just in a general place. When you go to a place where there's a horrible, contagious illness, if you're not a doctor who's immunized, who, who has the immune system, sign in place, you have to be very careful. Is it possible you're going to come out stronger? Maybe. But you have to make sure you're equipped. A doctor who's equipped, you could send into places because you know he's equipped. This means that Yaakov had to have the confidence that Dina was equipped. There was nothing to be afraid of. If not, he should be given rewards. He would be irresponsible to do otherwise. Rashi is teaching us here something about Dina. And we can understand it. If she is the stuff of transformation. For her transformation is so real. It's so powerful. She never believes in determinism. She never believes who you are today is who you have to be tomorrow. She knows the power of choices. She knows the power of transformation. She knows the fact that even if you look in the mirror and you see a person filled with trauma and a person filled with fear and a person filled with insecurity and a person filled with tremendous pain and maybe anger and frustration, you felt betrayed again and again and again. You could still choose in the next moment to live a life filled with promise and vitality and excitement, and confidence, and optimism, and hope, and trust, and faith, and wholesomeness. Esau struggled. Esau was not a simple kid. He was a complex person. He wasn't a kid at this point. They were were pretty, uh, they they have come of age. 
but there was no question about Dina. But we see one more thing here. Not just who Dina was. We see here the Jewish perspective on reaching out to somebody and helping them find their way back to their soul. We see the value of that. Sometimes a person says, What do I need these tzaras? What do I have to reach out? Fine, I'll do good things within myself. But if somebody has the power, if somebody has the quality, if somebody has the skill to bring back an ace of, an ace of, an ace of, to bring back an ace of, and that gift is not given to them, that availability is not given to them, it's seen as something so painful, as an opportunity lost that is so powerful. We see here from a clear Rashi, the Torah perspective on the extraordinary gift, privilege of somebody going out, reaching out, and embracing a soul that is lost, embracing a heart whose light has been extinguished, embracing a person who's been alienated, embracing a person who has maybe fallen into the abyss and helping them find their hope, their peacefulness, their God, their destiny, their true soul. Combined with these, combining these two truths together, a picture emerges. Dina had a unique skill for this. We were not putting her into a danger zone saying this will not turn out good because Asaph will defeat her. Who knows on how many levels? No. When Dina stands in front of Asaph, we know Asaph will be not only mesmerized by her physical beauty, he will be mesmerized by her spiritual beauty. He will be mesmerized, touched, moved, affected, transformed through Dina. And imagine what Yitzchak couldn't do what Rivka couldn't do, what Yaakov couldn't do, who's going to do it? Little Dina. Little Dina is going to do it. It just shows us who this girl was. And in fact, and this is again in the brackets, but I think it works well here, those who say that Leah was supposed to give birth to a boy. So Dina, who was the boy? The boy was Yosef. In other words, Dina here was substituted with Yosef. But you'll know the story of Yosef. He will be the one who, whose brothers will despise him. They will not understand him. He dreams of transforming the world. The brothers don't know what he wants. The brothers are shepherds. Yosef, what are you dreaming? As we say in English, dream on, Yosef. This is not our Messiah. This is not our tradition. And he doesn't only dream about agriculture. He dreams about the sun and the moon, 11 stars. This kid is ambitious. He has the sun bowing down to him, the moon, and all the 11 stars are bowing down to him. In other words, he wants to be the master not only of earth, even of heaven. Besides, the whole economy is going to be under him. The brothers are jealous. His father, who had a lot of experience already, preserved his statement. Indeed, Yosef changes the world. Yosef was not made to remain in the cocoon of the tent. Some people are destined to do that. This is not a critique on his brothers. It's defining different journeys for different souls. Some souls are too big. They can't be stifled. Lahavdil, what would Mozart look like if he didn't have a piano in childhood? What would Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart look like if there was no piano? Where would the genius go? burn down houses, destroy buildings. Thank God he had a piano. So he had an outlet for his genius, for his creativity. Many children are little Mozarts. Nobody gives them a piano. If you don't give them a piano, what do they do with it? Instead of the world being enriched by their music, they are, dubbed, they are labeled as mazikim, as hazards to society, as hazards to civilization. Yosef was one of those kids. They said, he can't be part of this family. He's just out of the box. This is not part of the Jewish tradition. From their perspective, they were right. They were holy people. They just didn't understand who Yosef was. Now let's go to the female side. <coughs> and let's remember that Rabbeinu Bechaya. Who did Yosef marry? Yosef married Asnas. Who was Asnas? Chazal tell us she was Dina's daughter. Asnas was born from the relationship of Dina with Shechem. 
Dina and Shem had intimacy, as we see. She became pregnant. She didn't even want to leave the house. The brothers took her. The baby was Asnas. Asnas had a very difficult time growing up in that family. Yaakov sent her to Egypt. Yaakov sent Asnas, his granddaughter, his daughter's daughter, whose father was not Jewish, his father was Shechem, sent her to Egypt. But Yaakov gave her a piece of jewelry, and he wrote on it that she belongs to the family of Yaakov. And when Yosef was chosen to become the prime minister of Egypt, there was a ticker they prayed. You ever at one of those prayers? Huh? D-Day? Nobody here was D-Day? Okay, I also don't remember D-Day. But you remember Tikka Day prayed for whom? Huh? Yeah, yeah. So the Torah says that when Yosef became the Prime Minister of Egypt, he was 30 years old, and he went out on all of Egypt. He went out to the country, to the, to the land. And everybody greeted him, and there was a prayer for him. In fact, at his deathbed, Yaakov will speak about Yosef. And what will he say about him? Ben Poirus Yosef. Yosef is charming. Ben Poirus Alei Oyen. He's charming to the eye. Bonoi Sada Alei Shur. Says Rashi. The girls of Egypt would walk on the fortresses surrounding the city to get a, to get a good look at Yosef. Why is Yaakov bringing that up on his deathbed? Apparently, this was a very fateful moment in Yosef's life. And one of the girls who came out to the parade was Asnas. And she decided to cast her piece of jewelry on Yosef. And when he looked at it, he saw this girl belongs to the family of Yaakov. And he married Asnas. Asnas and Yosef, therefore, became the parents who were both, grew up by Yaakov, but they were sent out of the family. They were sent out of the family as outcasts. Yosef was thrown into a pit and sold as a slave. Asnas was seen as a not fully legitimate child for good reason. Because of the tragedy that happened with Dina. But ended up what happened? Yosef became the one who saved his own family. <laughs> as he told his brothers, you wanted to sell me. But God sent me. You tried selling me. But God sent me. Yosef didn't look at himself and say, I am a victim of abuse. That's the beginning, middle, and end of my story. He could have. Could have sat and his whole life defined himself as a victim of abuse, and it would have been true. His mother died when he was nine. He was kidnapped when he was 17 by his family, not by the mafia. Even worse. Thrown into a pit, sent into sent as a slave, accused of violating a woman whom he never did violate, Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison for 13, 12 years. Is there a man you know who suffered more injustice than Yosef? And if any psychoanalyst would see his resume, what would they say would be his destiny and fate? No medicine would help, no therapy would help. Nothing to do for such a kid. He must be miserable and bitter. Yosef cried, but he was never bitter. He is the most, one of the most charming, happiest people in the Tanakh. And he even forgives his brothers. What was his secret? Not that he didn't have pain. He understood the secret of transformation. And because he could transform himself, he could reframe his life. You can have two pictures. One picture is beautiful, but it had the wrong frame. All you need is, anybody ever came to your dining room and told you the truth? You need a new frame. And the new frame is a different picture. But you didn't change the picture. You reframed the picture. Yosef didn't change the picture. He reframed his picture. And when you reframe it, it looks different. It has a different context. Yosef saw everything that happened to him. He reframed it. Instead of saying, I'm a victim of abuse, I was like a ping pong ball, thrown all around. He said, I was sent on a mission by the master of the world to transform darkness into light. Because he could transform himself. Not transform the facts. Transform 
his perspective, his experience, his choices, he could transform the world. People who can't transform themselves can't transform people outside of them. Yosef could transform himself. So where he sees, when he looks at something, he sees always the potential for transformation. He never allows anybody he comes in contact with, with to remain a victim because he brings that out in people. Even his brothers who are petrified and Yosef says, don't be depressed. They shouldn't be depressed. They're the perpetrators. He shouldn't be depressed. Oh, he said, I'm good. You don't be depressed. Sometimes the perpetrator ends up in a much worse place than the victim because we know the perpetrator himself is a victim to his or her need to live such an impoverished, miserable life. This is not absolving no perpetrators. Please don't take it that way. But it's explaining what Yosef is telling his brothers. You don't be depressed because I know how depressed you are. Because when you hurt somebody else, when you throw somebody into a pit, it's not that person you threw into a pit only. You put yourself into a pit. That person could get out, but how are you going to get out of that pit? In many ways, it could be much worse because you can't lie to the person in the mirror. You could lie to everybody else, but you can't lie to the person in the mirror. Yosef had a clear conscience. Yosef had a clear soul. Yosef was transformed. He could transform the world. Dina was transformed. She could transform the world. She could transform even Esau. This is who Dina is. And when you understand the value of transforming a life, when you understand the value of going out to an Esau, of going out to a teenager, to a child, to an adult, a young adult, an older adult, a man, a woman, a child, and bring them back. Bring them closer to who they are, to who they really are. That opportunity is perhaps the greatest achievement a person can do in life to the point that when Yaakov tells Dina, you can't. I want you in a box. For Dina, this is the very, very wrong decision. Rashi is teaching this even to a child learning Chumash. For Dina, this is a wrong decision. Once I have this Rashi and I come to Vatet say Dina, of course Rashi is highlighting the positive quality of Dina. And take even a look at the words of the Pasuk. Vatet say Dina Lirois Bivnois Haaretz. And Dina went out to gaze at the daughters of the land. Literally it means she went out like a tourist. A tourist goes, you travel to Europe, you travel to Asia, you travel to Africa, wherever you travel, you want to see. You want to see the culture, you want to see the museums, you want to see the bus rides, you want to see the people, you want to see the restaurants if you're going to Israel and you're Jewish. Okay, at least you got it. You want to know how I know this? Well, if Rashi is telling me that Yaakov is punished, when in my mind, in our mind, he's trying to protect his daughter, it means that knowing your Dina, you don't have to be afraid. She will pass the test of Esau. <laughs> she will pass the test of Esau with flying colors. Not only, not only will she pass with flying colors, at the end of their connection, he will be flying. And his colorfulness will come out rather than his confusion and uncertainty. Perhaps he understood, but from his perspective, we'll see in a moment, Yaakov had a different vision. I never saw that. That I never saw. I'm explaining to you who these girls were. <laughs> they could take on the world. They were powerhouses. Yeah. She threw that piece of jewelry on Yosef. Why? She knew he was going to find her. She was a smart girl. Okay. Okay. Okay, N not mamish every, not alt mamish. One minute, one minute. Yes, the connections are very intricate. 
Of course Yaakov had a perspective. Yaakov was a saintly man. Yaakov was doing what he felt was the best thing. In other words, it was God's will. When you say there was a negative penalty, it doesn't mean Yaakov was acting and thinking he's doing the wrong thing. But it means nonetheless we sometimes make mistakes. Not out of maliciousness. We sometimes don't evaluate a situation. We don't evaluate a moment. And forfeiting such a moment of transforming Esau was too painful a reality. Here you had the moment of transforming Esau. When you know you can touch a person, even though everybody calls them Esau, to stop and say it's much safer to do nothing. It's always safer to do nothing. Nobody ever criticized anybody for doing nothing. In fact... That's what she said. That's what she said. Okay, we'll do questions after. So what happens here is, the questions are good, I just want to remain focused on our, on, our, on our discussion. It's easier for me always to say, let me stay home, let me sit on my couch, let me do nothing. When I do nothing, I'm never criticized. If I could just close my mouth, I'll never be criticized. <laughs> No clips, no whatsapps, no viral. He said, he meant, he said this. How do you say this? How do you say that? It's always safer to be passive. It's always safer never to have a position, to sit on the fence. You're safe and you're good with everybody and everybody loves you. But the question is, is the purpose of life to be safe? If you wanted to be safe, your soul could have remained in heaven and over there it remains in the ultimate safety. The purpose of life was not to remain safe. The purpose of life was to transform darkness into light on every level. And when Dina is deprived from that ability, it's a painful reality with painful consequences. Now we know throughout the entire Tanakh, when we want to describe somebody going out to see something, or see somebody, the expression should be, Vatetz in this context, Vatetz e Dina Lirois, Es B'noi Sa'aretz. Or just Benosa Aretz. Dina went out to see the woman, the young women of the land. Vatetse Dina Leroy's Benosa Aretz. Dina went out to see the girls of the land. Or Leroy's S. Benosa Aretz would have been appropriate. What does it say? Vatetse Dina Leroy's? Bivnoisa Aretz. Literally translated, Dina went out to see, to look into the girls of the land. What did she want to see? What's inside? The outfits, she wanted to see where it was designed, in China or Italy? In France or in Copenhagen? What did she want to see inside? Leroy's bivnoi sarets. Leroy's bivnoi sarets, she wanted to see. She wanted to social, she wanted to see the people. I understand, you want to go out, meet people, see the culture. So Rashi says, Vatayt Seydina, she's bas Leia, she's just like Leia. Yatzon is just like Leia. Vatayt Leia Likrosoi is not negative at all. Leah was trying to build the Jewish family. Leah was trying to build the Jewish world. Like mother, like daughter, Dina went out to transform Shechem. Dina went out to influence B'nai Sa'aret, to see the inside, to see their potential, to see their creativity, to see their goodness, to see their holiness, to extract from them who they really are. Dina went out as an ambassador Yosef said, God sent me Lemichir Shlachani. Dina went out as an ambassador, as an emissary, as a Shliach Kavayachal of the Rebbeinu Shalaylam. Lira is Biv Noisaretz. To be able to see the Pnimiyas, the inside of the Noisaretz. You can't influence somebody if you don't see them. You can't impact somebody if you don't contact them. You can't change somebody if you don't understand them, if you don't connect to them, if you don't empathize with them. If you don't share a certain intimacy with them in terms of friendship, of camaraderie, which is why Dina had to meet Esau. If Dina could transform Esau, she could certainly meet the girls of Shechem. Lirais Bevnois Haaretz. It doesn't even say Bnei Haaretz because Dina had boundaries. It says Bnois Haaretz. She knew that she could transform the entire female society of Shechem, or at least the girls her age. And once you transform the women, the men are already no-brainers. As some of you know all too well. Ishak Sheira, Oyser means a good woman does the will of her husband, 
But we all know the second interpretation, Oysa, she creates, she makes, Ritzayin Baila. Vatetze Dina, Lirois Bivnois Aretz. Rashi says, Ki'ima Kibita. Now here you'll ask, granted, it's completely positive. Sadly, Shechem encountered her, and everything changed. But isn't it interesting, just to highlight one point in history, was Dina's vision implemented, or was Dina's vision not implemented? In a strange and tragic way, it's exactly what happened. Although not in the way that Dina planned it. Because what happens after? Dina is abducted. Shechem never gives her out. She remains kidnapped. People think that the war of Shimon and Levi was completely unwarranted. They had to fight to get their sister out of the palace. Just Yaakov didn't want them to kill the whole city. Yaakov wanted them to kill the perpetrator. Go into the palace. Shimon and Levi felt that the city is going to defend them. Everybody's going to come to defend them. When your prince is being attacked, who comes to defend? Everybody. Remember, they were all vulnerable. This is no open democracy. Even in democracy, people are vulnerable to propaganda, as some of you know all too well. But certainly in these places, these are ancient monarchs. You listen, and if you didn't listen, kaput, you came out with a head shorter. Shimon and Levi imagined they're going to declare war against the palace. They're going to deal with the whole city. Their chachma was, have them all circumcised. They'll be weak. They won't be able to defend themselves. And when they did come to defend themselves, they killed them and they took Dina. Yaakov was still upset. This was the argument in Yaakov and his children. It's not our topic today. But what happens after that? The Pasuk finishes the whole story and says, the brothers took their flock, took their sheep, took their donkeys, took everything in the city and the field. And then it says, Veskol chelam, veskol tapam, veskol neshehem, shavu vayavoizu veskol asher babayis. What happened to all the females of Shechem? What happened to all the children of Shechem? They all became part of the Jewish family. In a paradoxical and interesting way, the people that Dina went out to, to influence, of course, again, it happened with a lot of tragedy and bloodshed, but they all came in to a life of monotheism, to the life of Yaakov who lived by a morality in which you don't rape girls, in which you don't abduct a little girl in the street just because you can and violate them. In a fascinating way, part of this vision was affected. But now let's think about this. Even when you'll ask the question as you just asked, you still can't compare it to Leah. Because Leah went out to greet Yaakov. She's going out to greet the girls of Shechem. It's a whole different going out. But there's one last point that brings it all together. And very briefly, it goes like this. Let's remember in the beginning of Ayetze, when the Torah described the two sisters, it said, Rachel, Hoysa Yifas, Torah Yifas Mara. Rachel is beautiful. Ve'ene Leah, the eyes of Leah, Rakos, are weak. Rashi says, why are they weak? Or soft, Rakos means soft. Why? Remember what Rashi says? She wept. And this is the last Rashi that brings it all together. Why did she weep? So Rashi says, Shahayu Oimrim, they used to say, Lavan has two daughters, Rivka has two sons, Rivka and Lavan are brothers, sisters, siblings, first cousins. The older girl for the older boy, and the younger girl for the younger boy. Leah for Esav, Rachel for Yaakov. That's what they used to say. Leah wept, Leah sobbed, it affected her eyes. Now I ask you a question. Who is this Shahayu Oimrim they used to say? A couple of yachnas in Evergreen? A couple of yachnas in Wesley Kosher, or all fresh or all green, or this shop or that shop? You know how people make shiduchim by counters? In supermarkets by shop? Oh, I have a great idea! Leah! And do I have a boy for you? He's talented. He's handsome. Great hunter. And a chef. You will never have to be in the kitchen again, Leah. He's strong, he's a provider, he's a nurturer. Leah, do we have a shidduch for you? So Leah goes home weeping. If I was Leah's friend, I would say, Hubbard Zegazak, another Yenta said something. So what? You marry who you want to marry. You're not going to marry off a girl without her consent. We see it by Rivka. They asked Rivka what to do. Hubbard and Ishallah Spia. Rashi says, Ain't Messina Sishallah Medaita. You never marry off a girl without her consent. Ask Leah. Leah will say no. 
a couple of people that in Yiddish is an expression called mikvenayas. Mikvenayas. The men in the mikveh, they share news. By the Kedushan, by the Bris, by the Bamitzvah, by the Sheva Brachas. What's the Shah Yoimrim? Why is Leah crying? Obviously, the Shah Yoimrim wasn't just a couple of Yachnas or Dvoshas or Yentas who didn't have what to speak about, so they had to analyze Leah's future. Leah understood that this observation was a deep observation. It was a genuine observation. There was a connection between Leah and Esau. There was a connection between Rachel and Yaakov. They were connected. There was a soul connection. And Leah wept. She understood the connection, but she didn't want it. What was the connection? The way the Torah describes it is, Leah wept. Is that a way to describe a girl? Rachel is beautiful, and her sister cries. Great. That's how you speak about somebody? We're introducing two girls for the first time. Rachel, you fast toy, you fast. Imagine a shatchan comes to you. There's two sisters for two of your boys. One is beautiful, the other one cries. Say valedictorian by Syakov, by Srochel, by Sarah, by Srivka, Benoist Sans. Then you'll say she also cries. All go along, many people cry. Girls cry, they giggle and they cry. It's a normal thing. It's how God made them. The Gemara says, Isha de Masa Matsuya. A lot of Hassanim, sometimes Hassan teachers don't teach the Hassanim that their wives are going to cry. They get scared. They sometimes get overwhelmed. They think their wife wants a divorce. People cry. It's a very normal thing. It's the Ekvelt. This was a description of Leah. Rachel's soul was connected to Yaakov. Leah's soul was connected to Esau. What's the connection? We see it clearly in one story. Rashi doesn't bring the story, but the Medrash Rabbah brings the story. In the morning, when Yaakov was deceived and he was given Leah as a wife instead of Rachel, it says in the morning he saw it's Leah. He ran to Lavan. He said, why did you deceive me? Did he say anything to Leah? You wake up in the morning and you see that you were given the wrong wife. It's pretty traumatic if you ask me. Imagine it happened to you. You get married, you go home, you play house, you wake up in the morning and you see another person. Instead of the chassan seeing his wife, he sees his mother-in-law, his sister-in-law. It's pretty horrible. What did he say to Leah? I want to know, what did he say to Leah? He ran to love on. Why did, what did he say to his wife? Pasuk leaves it up to our imagination. The Medrash fills in the gap, as always. The Medrash says he turned to Leah and he said, Leah, like father, like daughter. Same expression. Fascinating. Like father, like daughter. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as we would say in America. Your father is a seasoned liar. And I see that you make him proud. What did Leah respond? She gave an extraordinary response, but disturbing. She said these words, every skill in life needs to be cultivated and you always need a mentor to teach you how to do it. My father and I had a great mentor and I'll tell you about him. There was an old man who couldn't see. And he called his son and he said, bring me food and I'll bless, I'll bless you. And his brother deceived his father and said, I am the older brother. He stole the blessings by deceiving his father. He is our mentor. He taught us how to do these things. Hoo <laughs> This is a real Jewish couple. It's like, don't mess with me, <laughs> Yaakov. <laughs> you give me a shtech, and the stab is going to be quadrupled. She's a sharp lady, Leah. But now I ask you a question. How could this marriage be sustained? <laughs> Imagine having such a conversation with your spouse the morning after the wedding. It's like a great recipe for a honeymoon and for shalom bayi. I mean, this can't be sustained. But really, what's disturbing is Leah's response. Say Yaakov was wrong. 
What does it have to do with Leah? I'm allowed to lie to you and cheat you and backstab you and deceive you because I know a story about your past. So you have to do tshuva. Because you sinned, I'm allowed to sin. Is Leah just trying to insult Yaakov, denigrate him, get back on him? Is this revenge? Is this a response? Uh, Okay, okay. (laughs) Of course, now we can see it come together. Yaakov was, Leah was giving Yaakov a very profound response. Leah's soul was connected to Esau. There was a reason for it. Ene Leah Rakos. Rachel Yefas Toyev Yefas Mara. Leah and Rachel were two very different types of people. What we call in works of Hashkafa, Kabbalah, Chasidus, the Avoida of the Tzaddik and the Avoida of the Baltruva. What does Rachel mean in Hebrew? A you, a sheep. E W E. Rachel is a you. It's a silent, easy animal, bright colored, white, beautiful, compassionate animal, even with a beautiful, compassionate voice. What's the gematria of Rachel? 238. Same numerical value as the words Yehi Ur, Vayehi Ur, and there was light. Check it out, Vayehi Ur, and there was light. 238. Because Rachel was a beautiful person. Not just beautiful on the outside, beautiful on the inside in the sense Rachel was a very wholesome person. When Rachel walked into a room, everybody said, the light arrived. She was the light and the life of the party. Vayhi'er, that's the you, the bright, beautiful, white-colored you. The you is not a rebellious animal. The you is an easygoing animal. Rachel was an integrated person. Rachel was filled with inner and outer beauty. Her life was an easier life. It was a cruise. It was a serene cruise on tranquil waters. What does the word Leah mean? Anybody remembers in Hebrew? Right. Exhaustion. Leut. Niloi nilei si the Navi says, I am tired. Nilu Mitzrayim, Parsha Shmois. The Egyptians were exhausted. They couldn't find water. It was all blood. Who names a baby exhaustion? You're going to sue your mother after this year. If you're na- you take your baby and you name her exhaustion. Wow, that's a great self-confidence booster. What's your name? Exhaustion. Leah wasn't exhausted from anybody else. Leah was exhausted from herself. Leah struggled. Leah was a deep soul. Different souls have different journeys. Leah struggled. Leah became an extraordinary person. But Leah had to work through work through herself, find her light. Leah had to fight for her soul. It was not easy. The weeping of Leah and the beauty of Rachel are not just two little comments. They represent two journeys. Leah is a person who knows what tears means. Leah had to confront pain. Leah had to deal with challenges and setbacks, stumbling blocks and overcome them. She had to fight for every piece of light she had. Rachel, as the Chazal say, as it says, Yifas <coughs> Toyar, Toyar is physique, symmetry of organs, and Mara is the countenance, and it's compared in Svarim, Yifas Toyar v. Mara, to the 248 mitzvahs assay, to the 365 loisasa, she was wholesome in her morality, she was wholesome in her spirituality. Rivka had two children, Yaakov and Esav. In the womb, they were struggling. Yaakov was gravitating to the Beis Medrash, to Torah. Asa was gravitating to pagan ashrams. As my teacher said, to, to churches. There were no churches at the time. But he was gravitating to pagan centers of idolatry. I ask you, did Asa choose that path? Did any of you choose what to do in the womb of your mother? Who chooses what to do in the womb of your mother? Whose choice is it? Anybody? It's who you are. It's your identity. It's your God-given identity. It's your genetic makeup. It's your soul makeup. In other words, Esau in the best scenario would never look like Yaakov. Even if Esau would have been the best of the best, la creme de la creme, what would he look like? He would look like a person who struggles with idolatry and vanquishes it. The worst thing you can have, one of the tragic things in a marriage is when a woman does not understand her husband. 
and when a husband does not understand his wife. I should put that a little differently. I don't know if any husband can understand his wife. But at least have respect for the journey of his wife. And conversely, what happens, a couple, they drift away and they presume things about their spouse without really knowing the truth. How many couples live their entire lives estranged emotionally, even in a subtle way, because they never ever discovered the full truth about their spouse. And so much of it is their presumption based on their own experiences. And sometimes based on the behavior of the other, which they misinterpret and misconstrue. The worst thing that can happen to Esau is if he marries Rachel. And Leah, Yaakov. The soul of Leah belongs to Esau. The soul of Esau belongs to Leah because they can understand each other. Rachel can appreciate Yaakov, Ishtam, Yoshev Eichalim, the quiet boy who dwells in tents. But something happens. In the tragedy of history, Leah rises. Leah transforms herself. Leah becomes a shining star. Leah sees her challenges as a catalyst for awareness and infinite growth. Esau sees his challenges as a license to promiscuity. Leah and Esau now can't get married to each other, nor can Esau carry the legacy of Judaism because Esau saw his evil as an invitation for a life of evil rather than as an invitation for a profound battle which will make you even greater than Yaakov. So who now has to carry the mission of Esau? Yaakov. Yaakov now has to have almost a dual identity. There's the Yaakov of Yaakov, and there's the Esau that Yaakov has to represent because the Jewish people will have both. Each of us has a Yaakov and an Esau, a Rachel and a Leah. Each of us is mixed and some people have this journey over this journey. So when Rivka tells Yaakov you have to dress up like your brother, it wasn't only physical garments, it was also psychological garments. Now Yaakov goes to marry his wife. Who does he want to marry? Rachel. Who does he end up marrying? Leah. He turns to Leah and says, why did you lie to me? And Leah tells Yaakov, I didn't lie to you. I had a mentor. You're the mentor. Leah was not insulting, denigrating, mocking, backstabbing, making fun, or threatening Yaakov that her mouth is sharper than his. Leah was telling him something very profound. The moment you went to your father and you told your father, Ani, Esav Bechayrecha, I am Esav. At that moment, you determined for yourself that I will be your spouse. Because the identity of Esau, that you assumed at that moment, that is connected to me. In other words, Yaakov has the Yaakov of Yaakov and the Esau of Yaakov. The Yaakov of Yaakov belongs to Rachel. The Esau of Yaakov belongs to Leah. Vatetze Leah. Leah goes out. Who was out? How is Esav described? Yaakov is in the tents. Who is Leah? Who is Esav? You remember? Yoideyat Sayyid Ish Sadeh. He's not indoors. He's outdoors. And how does the Pasuk describe it here? Yaakov comes back from the field. Who's the field? Why is it relevant? Vatetze Leah Likrosoi. Yaakov comes from the field. Who does the field belong to? That's Esau's domain, not Yaakov's domain. But at this point in history, Yaakov must acquire the mission of Esau as well. Yaakov must encompass that dual identity. He must be a father for children who struggle, as he must be a father for children who live a much more wholesome life, and their path is much more smooth and direct. Yaakov must be a father for the children who give you a very easy time, you put them into pre-1A, and the only time you'll get a call from the principal is the day of graduation of high school. 17 years you didn't get a cool call from the principal. You ever had such a child? Probably one. And then the child whom you're visiting school in their honor two day, times a day, sometimes four times a day. And you have researched every conceivable school in Muncie and in all of New York and in the entire tri-state area to figure out how do I deal with my dear beloved child who usually has more energy and more depth and more creativity, but their path is often one of struggle? Yaakov must be the father to both. And Leah represents children who will excel in the art of tshuva. 
Reuven, her oldest, will be the one who will confess and do tshuva. Yehuda will be the one who will confess publicly about what he did with Tamar. They will all be the people who will struggle with Yosef, and it says they hated Yosef. Rachel's children are completely in a different place. Rachel's children, Yosef and Benjamin, but ultimately, Yaakov ultimately assumes that identity too. And when he assumes that identity, Leah says, I didn't lie to you. You chose me that day when you told your husband, your father, I'm Esau. You chose me, Leah, even though you also have Rachel. So now, what happens with parents and children is this, and we bring it together. What happens with parents and children is what often remains in the parents in potential is realized through the children. Very often, there will be something in you that is dormant. It's there, and it will come out in your children. And by the way, in both ways, <laughs> positive and negative, our children sometimes bring out everything that's happening in ourselves, just as they bring out everything that's happening in our marriages. Couples could sometimes be in denial about what's going on. Look at your children and you'll stop being in denial. Sometimes our children are our greatest alarm clocks if we can only open ourselves up to truth. People don't like doing it because who are my little brats to teach me about life? They will teach you everything about life. Whatever I repress, whatever I suppress, whatever I deny, my children will somehow shout from the roofs of my house. That's what children, that's what children do. Not even by choice, that's what they do. They play out what is happening inside in the negative and in the positive. They're a great alarm clock. Learn from your children. They will teach you tremendous truths about yourself, about your spouse, and about your relationship with each other. When there is dysfunction in a house that is being repressed and denied, and we have a choice to work on it, our children will not remain silent to that repression. They will play it out, especially in this generation, when everything is being played out on the open. They will play it out. But it's also in the positive. Leah was the soul who was destined to marry Esau. But she never did. In Leah's times, Esau wasn't ready. Leah had to marry Yaakov, who would assume the identity of Esau. But like mother, like daughter, Leah would ultimately give birth to those children who would excel as Bali Tshuva who would embody tshuva. The Gemara says about David, who came from Yehuda, the king of Leah's children. David was not supposed to do what he did with Bathsheba, but Hakim Oyla Shal Tshuva, he created the path of tshuva for all generations. The same with Reuven, her oldest, and Yehuda, her king. Leah goes out to the field to greet Yaakov. She wants to build the Jewish people, build those children who will be able to carry on the holiness of Esav's mission, of Esav Shlichus. In her child, Dina, this story will emerge and flower and blossom in its full creativity. What remains by Leah in a state of dormant potential? By Dina, not completely dormant potential. It comes out, but it comes out within the Jewish family. By Dina, it emerges in much greater splendor to the point that her mission is to go and transform Ace of himself. Yaakov! is of a different philosophy. Yaakov was destined to marry Rachel. Yaakov says, Dina, stay in the tent. Don't go to Esau. Yaakov was right for Yaakov. But Dina is a daughter of Leah. Bas Leah. Dina goes out. Dina could change the world. You can't lock up Dina because Dina can transform Esau. Dina has the power to change the whole world. Dina has the power to transform the landscape of the earth into a divine abode. You can't put Dina in a box. That's not modest for Dina. That takes away from Dina her greatest mission, her greatest shlichus. You have to be careful, but this is who Dina is. Ah, Yaakov will scream and say, I don't understand. Leah, her mother, ran away from Esau. After all these years, Dina now could encounter Esau and transform Esau. And not doing that is a tremendous painful reality because Udina is like mother, like daughter of Atei Dina. Leah went out. Leah had that quality. 
She went out. Dina can also go out. And she goes out. It's like mother like daughter. In the most positive sense. And indeed even after the catastrophe. Caused by Shechem as we said. The entire female population of Shechem. Is indeed transformed. Have a wonderful week. Next Tuesday there is no class. I am in London. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.